to smile. I'd force myself to laugh, but I felt like I just wanted to die. If she came to you, what would you do? He would get this look in his eyes and start yelling. I would still be in the room, but it was like I was somewhere else. Could you place the call that would stop his suffering? It was like, whatever happens to me, happens. But when I saw him come into my sister's room, something just snapped. Could you make the report that might stop her pain? When abused children turn to you, will you be ready to protect them? Will you be able to stop their pain and change the dark shadows of their suffering to light? Most abused children are powerless to stop their pain. They are trapped in a dark world. They're unable to protect themselves, and they're too scared to reach out to others. You are a child's best chance at escaping this tragic cycle. Every year, California's mandated reporters save thousands of children from abusive situations. These children owe their lives to alert, caring professionals who took swift action. You, as a mandated reporter, are really the first line of defense against child abuse. You are the eyes and ears of the agencies who investigate reports and then act to protect children. Children have nobody but adults to help them. And when the adults in their lives are abusing them, they have no one to help them but other people. When we see children who are helpless, I think it's important that we protect those children because they're part of our family, not just our personal, our biological family, but part of our human family. We've created a safety net, and that safety net is all of the providers in the world, and that's all the moms and dads and all the, the policemen and firemen and all the teachers and all the social service people and all the physicians and nurses and other practitioners. Um, and that safety net is really there so that the child will won't fall through the cracks. If these children are in any form of danger, if these children, whether it's abuse, whether it's neglect, we have the, the responsibility to protect these children. In order to take proper action, you must know your legal obligations, recognize the types of abuse, eliminate stereotypes of child abusers, know how and where to report, and finally, overcome the fears and frustrations that often accompany child abuse reporting. The first step is to understand your legal obligation. While everyone should report child abuse, it's a crime for certain people not to report. California has strict laws that require mandated reporters to report knowledge or reasonable suspicions of child abuse within a specific time frame. Mandated reporters are only required to report when they encounter abuse within the scope of their employment or while acting in a professional capacity. Mandated reporters have immunity from civil and criminal liability. However, there are both civil and criminal penalties for a mandated reporter who fails to make a report. The reporter's identity is kept in strict confidence. Sometimes they are subpoenaed to testify on what they observed or heard, but even then they are not identified as the person who filed the child abuse report. Reporting is an individual duty. By law, a supervisor or administrator may not stop you from reporting. We all work as a team in the emergency room. While all of us may witness evidence of abuse, we designate one person to do the reporting. Even though that person reports, we are all responsible for ensuring that the call is made and the report is filed. A mandated reporter cannot shine away their responsibility. A mandated reporter must report the incident themselves. They must follow through. And no one can alter their responsibility of that person from reporting. We need to be about kids. And we cannot afford not to report. What am I going to gain by not reporting? Upon employment, mandated reporters should be made aware of their responsibilities. Your employer is required to have you sign a form that acknowledges your obligation to report child abuse. This obligation extends to a wide variety of professionals. One of the largest groups of mandated reporters is child care custodians. This category includes some people you might expect, such as teachers, employees of child care facilities, and social workers. 
It also includes some people you might not expect, such as administrators of youth camps, probation and parole officers. You could be the one single individual who makes a difference in that person's life. And unless they have us to rely upon for any type of reporting, who else is going to speak up for the child? You're in the kid business, and if you care about kids, then you need to report. Those kids need our protection. Many people in health-related fields who come in contact with children are also mandated reporters. You have to worry about the child first. You have to follow through on that gut feeling and don't be worried about the consequences because the consequences could really be saving that child. Employees of child protective agencies must also report. They should report to protect children because children can't protect themselves. My main concern is that it stops. It stops and he doesn't do it to your child, doesn't do it to my child. Firefighters, child visitation monitors, animal control and humane society officers, and people who process film and videotape fall into their own categories of mandated reporters. I care about children, just as I care about animals. It's my responsibility to be able to help these children that are locked into situations that they can't escape from. Additionally, many of you work with volunteers. Volunteers are not required to report child abuse. They should, however, be encouraged to receive proper training and discuss any suspicions or concerns with their supervisor. Once you understand your legal obligations, you must learn to recognize the types of abuse. Child abuse is divided into four general categories. Physical abuse, sexual abuse, physical neglect, and emotional maltreatment. Physical abuse is physical injury inflicted on a child by other than accidental means. Physical abuse is often easy to identify because the signs of the abuse remain on the child's body. Family members often give confusing or conflicting stories on how the injuries occurred. The child frequently seems uneasy and frightened about discussing the cause of the injury. Sexual abuse is the sexual assault on or the sexual exploitation of a minor. Some indicators of sexual abuse can include inappropriate sexual activity and curiosity, victimizing other children, promiscuity, excessive self-consciousness of one's body, and sometimes self-destructive behavior. Sexual abuse that's going on inside the family, there's a real secrecy to that and uh, children won't tell. They're often told not to tell, and they do as they're told. Physical neglect is the negligent treatment or maltreatment of a child by a parent or caretaker. Physical neglect can be very subtle and more difficult to detect than physical abuse, but must be reported. Neglected children will often be listless or hungry. They may be depressed, apathetic, or antisocial. Children who come in who have been neglected are children who come in with an array of anger, a, an array of feeling unsafe and feeling frustrated and feeling that nobody really cares. These children are not just physically abused or emotionally abused. These children are neglected. Emotional maltreatment occurs when a person causes or permits any child to suffer or inflicts on any child unjustifiable or significant mental suffering. Emotional maltreatment is sometimes reported on its own, but more frequently is reported along with physical or sexual abuse or neglect. These children often have had years of abuse and the impact on them psychologically as well as physical is beyond comprehension. Because they continue to feel that nobody's gonna do anything, that nobody cares, that nobody loves them that they will always be victims. Who are these people who hurt children? The answer to this question can be surprising. By eliminating your preconceived picture of an abuser, you will be in a better position to protect children. We think of the classic uh, molester as a person that jumps out from the bushes uh, on the, and molests the kids on the way to school. That's not the cases that I see. These people that are hurting kids are different types of people different types of jobs, different type of education, different type of upbringing. It runs the gamut from people who, in every sense of the word, we might consider to be normal to people who are, uh, in every sense of the word, uh, s sadistic.
95% of the cases, uh, the children have been molested by somebody that is known to them and very close to them and has a close relationship to them. There is no way to tell by looking at an ordinary group of people who is an abuser and who isn't. It's what they do that tells what they are. When children are suffering, they need immediate help. Fortunately, mandated reporters do not need to determine if abuse is actually occurring. You only need to report a reasonable suspicion. Reasonable suspicion means that under the circumstances, it is objectively reasonable for you to suspect that a child has been abused. That takes the ultimate responsibility off the shoulders of the professional. They don't have to figure out whether the child was abused or not. You don't have to be sure, you don't have to be 100%, it's a suspicion. Remember, reporting only involves suspected child abuse. Not that you believe there is child abuse or there will be child abuse, but just suspected child abuse. Reasonable suspicion means to me that you have a gut level feeling that something is going on. You kind of rely a lot on your gut feeling. Go with your gut. If you feel that there's something wrong there, report it. Let us determine whether or not, in fact, there is something there. Once abuse is known or reasonably suspected, the reporting process begins. The first step the mandated reporter must take is to immediately report by phone. The reporter makes this initial call to a child protective agency. Your local child protective agencies are typically your county social services department, commonly referred to as Child Protective Services, or CPS, and your local police or sheriff's department. The second step is to file a written report with the agency you called within 36 hours. This written report is made on a Department of Justice form SS8572. This form can be obtained from your local child protective agency. Once you make the phone call and file the report, your reporting responsibilities are over. You become protected by the law and you avoid the penalties that might result from not reporting. Making a report of child abuse is not snitching, it's not accusing, it's not blaming, it's not judging. A person who, who suspects child abuse and makes a report is, in, is calling upon professional people who are trained to do this to make an investigation. While responses to reports may vary from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, the basic procedure is similar. When you call CPS, what you're going to do is get a social worker who is trained in taking phone referrals. Their job is really to take a look at the indicators of abuse and make a decision about how quickly we need to respond. And although we may not be able to respond right then and there to your specific report, you may be coming in and telling us information that supports a prior referral. What's important to understand is that we have to have sufficient data to make a, a determination about how we're going to respond to the case and that's very important in terms of the mandated reporter's role. The more information they can give us, the better our response will be and the better quality our response will be. Knowing how and when to report is the responsibility of all mandated reporters, but for many the very thought of reporting is frightening. All too often, mandated reporters fail to take action due to their fears. Fear of being wrong, fear of retaliation, fear of liability, and fear that the child will be removed from the home. All are common among mandated reporters. The fear factor certainly deters a lot of people who would normally file a report. And I remember the first time I got a subpoena to testify in a child abuse case, and I was very frightened. I can understand people's reluctance. They're unsure of the criminal justice system. They're not sure that anything's going to be done. They're concerned about exposing themselves to liability. You have to get beyond your own fears, and you have to think about your responsibility to the children. It's hard. It's scary. A lot of us worry about whether we're going to lose our, prof our license. Did we do this in anger? Did we do this uh, in frustration? Did we do this uh, vindictively? Uh, uh, we, we go through all those things. Forget the fear. Forget about being afraid to, to, to speak out for that child. That child needs to have someone protect them. The child is not strong enough, big enough to protect herself or himself. You have to be the one that says, I care enough about this child to take the risk. I care enough about this child to make this child's world a better place. 
Additionally, you may be frustrated because of stories you've heard or experiences you've had, believing that CPS won't respond, believing that you will never know the outcome of your report, or believing that your report doesn't matter are common frustrations. Frustration is not a good reason to avoid reporting to Children's Protective Services. They get frustrated because of confidentiality rules that prevent us from disclosing to them what it is we're doing, um, why we're not doing it, or why we are intervening in the way we do. Just as the police don't always respond and come out and arrest somebody when you report a crime, a child is not always removed from the home when you report something. The fact that you don't read something in the paper, the fact that a police officer doesn't come back to follow up with you, doesn't mean nothing's happening. In fact, frequently, your mere phone call gets the wheels rolling. And even if you report 10 times and nine of them, nothing happens, or 99 times and 99 things, have happened, things do happen, families do change a little bit because of each report, the system changes a little bit, there's a paper trail and things do happen. Nearly all abused children come into contact with one or more mandated reporters. That's a fact. You play a vital role in protecting those children. While you are required by law to report, you are not an investigator. Simply put, if you suspect, report. For the people who are reporting, I've just got to tell you how courageous I think you are and how, um, how what you're doing is, uh, is beyond, um, beyond nice. Uh, you make a huge difference in people's lives. And if you can bring in some light into what might be going on in that very dark environment that that child lives in, then you have to take the risk. Remember that, that the cycle of abuse continues forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. An abuser, uh, an abuser abuses somebody and that somebody often becomes an abuser and that abuser abuses somebody and that cycle just never stops until somebody says, it's going to stop here. Be their voice. And it's okay, even if your voice cracks and even if you start to cry, it's okay. Because it just, it's just a part of what we have to do. It's just the responsible thing to do. When I was little, I wondered why anyone would hurt me like that. No one talked about it. No one noticed. If you suspect child abuse, report. When the principal called me in, I thought I was in deep trouble. But then he didn't yell or anything. He just wanted to help. Make children your priority. You may be the only light in an abused child's dark world. I wanted to run. I wanted to hide. But more than anything, I just wanted it to stop. Your report is the first step to turn an abused child's shadows of suffering to light. I'm not sure what is going to happen now. My whole family has a lot to sort out. I only know that it's over. I won't be hurt anymore.